Chief of the Wrap, and I'm your moderator today. And it is my great pleasure to welcome three Oscar-nominated, talented people from this movie. America Ferrera, nominated for the Best Supporting Actor. into the journey of its life, right? Like it's been months and many hundreds of millions of dollars. I'm just gonna remind you guys, um, this movie's made $1.4 billion at the Global Box Office. Uh, it's been screened. I did some math. My math says that at about $11 a ticket, 131 million people have seen this movie. Except. There's some, some people probably went to see it twice, so maybe, you know, take shave 10% off. Uh, that's a lot of people. And there was an exit poll they did last summer that said that 22% of the people who went to see Barbie had not been to the movie theater since the pandemic started. Wow. So, um, I can't think about my pen, so my pen has to stay here. So, I just wanted to give you that context because it's so rare that there's something that you get to participate in that has such an impact on the world. And um, you never know that going in and you don't really probably even recognize it as it's going through its phenomenal success. And then here you are kind of at the apotheosis of the recognition of the film's success. And so like, just wanna take a moment to appreciate what that, what that means for you guys and what that means for the movie industry in general. Um, but now I'm gonna ask you about you guys and what you contributed to this film. Um, so, America, thank you for being here. Uh, as I was just mentioning to you backstage, um, I first met you at the Sundance Film Festival, two, must be, let's say 2002? Two, yeah, 22 years ago. Yeah, okay, but we look great. Yeah. yeah. And I was five years old, I think. Yeah, you were five, and I was like 15, it was crazy. Um, she was seven, no, honestly, she was 17, Real Women Have Curves, uh, debuted at the yeah. festival. One second to say like it was this film that showed us a part of Los Angeles that we've never seen she was this young Hispanic actress who was not straight out of central casting either the way you looked or the you know the way you're shaped you had curves and it was so refreshing and it's been a thrill to follow your career since then and see all the things you've done you. ugly Betty superstore and now and now this yeah. Normally, when you get this part and you know that Margot is the center of the film, how is it that you think about the role and what purpose you bring to it in sort of grounding it in the real human being who's kind of at the heart of this, excuse me? Yeah, thank you for all the amazing things you said and kind of um, rattled off about the success of the film. I mean, you know, I think that no one could have anticipated the way that it landed but but watching it come together it was very much that the whole is somehow greater than the sum of its parts and to see you know from the very beginning to have a visionary like Greta Gerwig writing it and directing it wrote it with her partner Noah Baumbach but and, and, and then the talent of Margot and Ryan and all the incredible cast that came together but then to bring Mark Ronson in who brought on all these phenomenal it was just like the layers and layers and layers of talent and craft from our DP, Rodrigo Prieto, to our wardrobe and production design. It was like everywhere you looked, it was just, you know, it was just the A-team. And, and I think that, you know, I had never, shockingly, ever had dreams of being in a Barbie movie. That was not where I saw my career going. And, um, but knowing that it was Greta and knowing that it was Margot playing this character, you, I could see from page one uh, the the depth of it, that it was hilarious and 
I mean, you couldn't tell how beautiful it was going to be, but that it was unique from the beginning. You're like, this is the weirdest thing. Like, what is this? Are they really going to let her make this movie? But knowing Greta as, as a filmmaker and knowing Margot as an actress, realizing like, oh, this is working on all the levels. It's, it's funny and it's subversive, but it isn't afraid to be full of heart and to say something. And there was no fear in it. There was no fear in any part of it. It was like Greta was just there sort of encourage, encouraging everyone to bring all of their weirdness and their full selves and to turn every role and song and set piece into their the, the version of what they would want to be doing. And so for me, when I met Gloria, I, I had a moment independent from the actress being asked to play this role just as, as a woman in the world, as a, as, a, as a mother, I had two young children, and um, just the realization, the kind of the realization that Gloria has in the movie when she goes, oh, like, you came for me. Like, <laughs> when I read, when I had that moment, it was, this movie is for us. Like, it's about us. We got to, we get to be a part of it. It gets to have a real flawed human woman's, adult woman's perspective and experience to be a part of it. And so it felt so generous towards us, but it also felt so generous towards so many people. Like Ken's entire storyline didn't have to be there. This could have just been something like railing on how effed up patriarchy is, but Greta, like, and it wouldn't be wrong, but Greta gave, <laughs> Greta had the generosity and all, you know, to the audience, to all of us, to like give Ken this journey that also showed the other side of it that somehow Ryan Gosling like did the way Marlon Brando might play Ken. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And then to see Margo, you know, dip into playing Barbie, a plastic doll with all the heart and all the depth. You know, I, I can't even remember what your question was. But <laughs> Who cares? All, all I can just say, like, from the beginning, it was just like, this is so weird and crazy and fun and not afraid of anything. And what an amazing gift as an artist to be invited into something that isn't leading with, like, fear or leading to like copy or emulate you know, something else, but to say, we're making something entirely new. And we might all fail. Like there were moments where you're like, we're out on a limb right now with this one, and it could not work, but it did work. And I think the lesson is like, you're not always gonna come out the other side with Barbie, but if you don't go out on that limb and try to make something that feels and looks like nothing else, you're sure as hell not gonna get to Barbie. Mm -hmm. Great answer. Don't know the question. <laughs> um, so, Billy and Phineas, um, I'm so excited I get to meet you because uh, I've never gotten to meet you yet, and I've been a huge admirer of your work since um, the, the handful of years that you guys kind of burst onto the scene with such a big impact. Um, I think there's an interesting backstory to what your family connection might be to Barbie and Mattel. I wondered if you might start by sharing that. Um, yeah. Hi, guys. Um, well, our father, who's like sitting right there, raise your hand. Oh, wow. Dad, stand up. Say hi, everybody. Wow. And Mark, too. Hi, Mom. And my mom. Um, our dad was a carpenter at Mattel when we were kids, and we never saw him, <laughs> like literally ever. Um, but he, uh, yeah, he worked like... So Barbie's made out of wood? What am I not getting here? He was a carpenter. He, he built he built sets, sets. Um, uh, at Mattel, and you know he would leave at like four in the morning and come home late at night, and um, sometimes he would... Like, I, I thought it was really cool that he worked there because he... Um, Sometimes he would come home with scraps from Barbie sets that he would find in the garbage. And so like in dumpsters, sometimes he would like pull out like Barbies that had been thrown away or like pieces from sets. There was this one thing that he gave to me. Uh, maybe he shouldn't have been taking stuff, but he was. <laughs> um, there was one thing, it's okay now. <laughs> it was like an apple, like a little plastic apple that was like pink. It was like bright pink apple. And I just 
thought that was really cool. And I have it still somewhere in my house. But like a tiny Barbie size? No, oh, like an apple size. Oh, apple, apple size. Like apple. a fake plastic one. That was like part of Sunset. Um, yeah, yeah, for, for years, that's that was it. And um, he, you know, one time found a, an unopened Barbie, like holiday Barbie or something. <laughs> In like the garbage or something. Got that. <laughs> was awesome. yeah. So, so Barbie like had a certain mystique to you, even if like Barbie's more like my era, or maybe even older when it was like super cool, because you know there were other things that came in and kind of replaced it. Nothing, honest to God, nothing has replaced Barbie. Like for you, I I really don't think it's ever been replaced. I think there's been new things. You know, I think like. You know, I loved like Monster High dolls. That was my shit. But like, <laughs> Barbie was always Barbie. You know, it was never. It was never like, oh, who cares? It was. It was so. I think that's that. That um, it's kind of rare for for things to be so adored and and beloved and remain that way for generations and generations and generations. Because yeah. you know, I I didn't know. I had no idea Barbie was like an old thing. I was like. Oh my God, this is my favorite thing in the world, and I loved all my Barbies, and I, I treated them like gold. I loved Barbies so much. And then my mom would talk about Barbies and her Barbies when she was a kid, and I was like, wow, like this is such a, this is a, a, a lifelong, I don't even know. It's really amazing the way that it has uh, affected us all, I think. So, so it came about that Greta reached out to you, or you heard about the project, and said we'd be interested, um, yeah, they'd wrapped principal photography, um, and I, I like everybody else have kind of seen like TMZ photos of Margot and Ryan on rollerblades on the beach, and I've been like, damn, okay, um, and uh, you know we're huge fans of Greta and Noah, um, and and yeah, one of our team members, Paul, was having a meeting, um, totally separate from us, with Inan at Mattel. Oh. And Enon at this point was like, oh, and Enon Kreitz, who's the CEO, yes, of the correct, film. right? Yeah. And Enon was was exclaiming about how excited he was about Barbie, and he was he told our our um, team member Paul about like Mark is doing the soundtrack, and it's going to be amazing. And uh, you know, we the people that work with us champion us and are great. And he was like, well, you don't have a Billy song. And he was like, can we get a Billy song? And he was like, I'll call. Him. So we got this call out of the blue of like, do you want to maybe talk to Mark about doing something for the Barbie movie? And I was like, yes. Of course. Um, That's kind of crazy that we crazy. come through the CEO of Mattel. It's not usually part of the no, team. No, not usually. Team. I mean, no, for sure. So yeah. we got really lucky. Um, and then we were put in touch with Mark, and then Mark put us in touch with Greta pretty quickly. Um, and she was very adamant that we see the movie if we were going to write anything. Yeah. Which, again, like all of this, like I, I talk about this a lot, but we feel like fans who snuck into the back of like mm -hmm. the party. Um, and so the idea that we were going to get to see some rough cut of the movie six months before we would otherwise get to see it was enough to us that we were like, that's sick. Even if they don't want us to make a song, that's awesome. <laughs> um, so we got to go see, uh, it was the first 40 minutes assembled and then several scenes, America's Amazing Monologue, the, the now feel scene with Ruth, I'm just Ken. We got to see some really pivotal moments in the film. So, so the, you mean the dance scene? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. so we got to see these, these things to kind of take home with us and be inspired by. Um, and we just loved it. We just loved the, the film. We were super moved by it. Um, and we wrote the song the next day. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Do you guys write together? Does one of you write the words? One of you write It is music? really, at this point, you know, we've been working together since I was 13 and Phineas was 17. And that's we. those were our ages when they made a song called Ocean Eyes and put that out. And um, it's it's 13, really, 13. 13 and 17, it's ridiculous. <laughs> but um, it's changed a lot over the years, but um, I think at this point it's very, it's very 50-50. We are so, um, you know, when we, when we talk about a song we've written, it's like hard to remember who wrote what because it's very um, equally, con we're, we're equally contributing, I think, at this point, um, which is really, really fun. It's really amazing, I feel like, um, I mean, you know, I write on my own too, and Phineas writes on his own, but when we write together, it's really honestly like nothing else, and I can't really recreate it. Um, it's really, it's special, and I think that when we're inspired, like 
when we were, you know, the day after we saw Barbie, we were just like filled with, you know, I've said this a gazillion times, but like we hadn't been creative at all and we were not coming up with anything and we just were completely like stumped. We just had nothing, not about Barbie, like in general, we were no, trying no. to make this album and we were like, we have no ideas, we're not good anymore, this and that. And, you know, saw Barbie and 24 hours later, we had been working that day and not coming up with anything and not being creative. And I was like, dude, this is, I'm going home. This is, we're, we should stop. And then just Phineas was like, well, let's just take a crack at this Barbie thing. And I remember being like, bro, what? <laughs> you think after this whole months of not creating anything and this whole day of sitting here for six hours and coming up with a absolute garbage, we're gonna come up with an incredible Barbie song that's gonna be like good enough for this movie? Like, absolutely not. And we wrote it in like under two hours. <laughs> yeah, kind of amazing. So you, you saw the footage and you just went back to work like your normal work. You had a session and were working on an album. Yeah. At the end of that, you're like, well, let's try this. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Greta had said this thing when we were first speaking to her. She said, you know, what are you working on right now? I said, we're supposed to be working on Billy's next album. And she said, oh, great. Well, then this can be the way that you procrastinate. <laughs> and yeah. that was I awesome. Think, I think yeah, we, I felt, we felt so daunted by how little progress we felt we were making on the album at the time that I was like, oh my god, like we don't, we don't need to procrastinate, we can't even get the album going. But she was completely right, like it was such well, a stupid. She it, said, she was like, that's what I love when, yeah. she was like, when I'm working on a big project, I love a little distraction to work on. It was really smart. It's really true, but because that was gonna be one of my questions I was gonna ask you guys, is that why you do movie scores, because of course you wrote the song for James Bond, A Time to Die, as well. Like. What is appealing to you about that, given that you have your own very strong creative voice that you put out there that is an expression of you know the, the inner you and just what you guys do together, which is so special. Yeah. Then you, if you collaborate on something like a film, like you've got all this other inputs mm -hmm. and yeah. you know, it, so you're kind of answering the question that I was gonna ask later, but it's, Additive to the creative process for you to, to work on something that really kind of belongs to somebody else because it's Greta and Noah's vision sure. in a way, right? Um, well, you know I'm glad you asked because because you know writing for something especially film TV whatever it is but but having a prompt having some sort of um, guideline. guideline something to write about is is uh, it's my favorite game truly my favorite <laughs> game like it's like I don't know, there's something about it. I think having like an, I really like having an assignment. I really like having like a challenge and a, you know, I, I like having parameters. Rules. Rules, kind of. Um, and honestly, it's hard for me to be vulnerable sometimes in, in <laughs> a lot of ways, but in, in, in <laughs> um, making, <laughs> writing music. It's, I've said this before, but like I don't, I don't find it, easy and or fun to write about my own feelings most of the time. Oh yeah. And sometimes some people when they write songs really like writing about how they specifically feel in their experience. And I have found that really difficult and challenging and I don't it's really hard for me because I guess I it's hard for me to understand how I'm feeling until later. And so, you know, when I'm something that Phineas and I have done for our entire lives of, of writing music is given ourselves a like something to write about like a fake story like a yeah. here what if we wrote a song from the perspective of somebody who's like a rock climber and they like need to get do it whatever it is like you can just come up with anything and then you know write about it and there's something about writing for somebody else that I love so much, and yeah, yeah. I love putting myself in other people's shoes. And well, it might be easier in a way. It's, it's like a little less scary. Well, it's not Maybe. vulnerable. It's not very it's not vulnerable. vulnerable. You're, yeah. you're, well, it's so it's, interesting because you've also talked so much about how personal the song is. <laughs> well, that's the <laughs> thing is that when we were making this song, I wasn't thinking about myself. I was thinking about Barbie, and I was thinking about the movie, and I was thinking about you know. Oh, like there's footage of us writing the song. And me, you were thinking about me. Yeah, thinking about yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, literally. I, I was I was thinking about your monologue, and that was replaying over and over in my head, and I was not thinking about myself at all. And I, there's footage of us writing that song, and the whole time we we're like, well, you know, when like America says this, and then like Margot's doing this, and okay, so like if she, 
not about myself, not about me, not about my life. It's like Barbie, Ken, this, that. And then, you know, a couple days later, I'm listening to it, I'm playing it for a friend. I'm like, <laughs> who wrote this shit about my life? Because it wasn't me, but then it was. <laughs> so yeah, really weird. Because sometimes, sometimes that happens. Your subconscious is there, you know. And um, anyway, body blah. Well, if it's, I mean, I think that's it. Like, if it's good, it's honest. And if it's honest, then it's gotta relate to something real. Mm -hmm. So, um, and what I love also about it, especially in contrast to the other song, is that it's it's literally the yin yang of the movie, yeah. right? Like, one is this like fun you know, funny, yeah. you know, energetic thing, and then your song is so delicate and straight to the heart, it feels like. Yeah. Is, yeah. So, did you do, like, what was what were you thinking about, I guess? You're thinking about when you wrote it. What were you thinking? Do you, or are you aware of what you're thinking about? Because I know that it, it, it feels like it brings the heart of the movie out, the song, the film. Um, well, you know, when we saw Greta and we saw what she showed us of the movie, she kind of, you know, she, she was like, you, you can make anything, it doesn't matter, you, you, anything you want to make. Is that you, Greta? Is that you? <laughs> but like, she wouldn't give us an answer, right? She was, she still, you know, she was being so general, yeah. She, she, she's, you know, and she's like, you don't have to make, if you don't even want to make anything, you don't even have to, it's like, just don't even worry. But like, it really does sound like that. If you make something, like, and we were like, girl, shut the fuck up. Tell us what to make. Tell us what you want us to make, and we will make exactly what you want. Like, I wanted her to be happy, and that's all I wanted. I was like, girl, like, we're here for you. Don't be all, you guys can do whatever you want. Like, okay, sure, but like, tell us what you want, because we want to make what you want. And, you know, we eventually got her to be like, okay, okay, okay. If I could have anything, in an ideal world, if I could have anything specific, and you could do, you could do anything you want. <laughs> but if I could have one thing, it would be Barbie's heart song. And I want her heart. Oh, it makes me like choked up almost, because it's, like I just, I just think about how I felt when I was watching that movie for the first time and, and feeling her, you know, and, and and feel, you feel her heart, you know, you know her heart when you watch it. And, um, you know, we had replaying in our heads that scene where they're in the like white abyss and it's her and Ruth and she's crying and she takes her hands and she just says feel. Um, and originally when we saw it, it was, it was only the shot of Margot crying. There was no montage and there was no song. And um, we knew we wanted to make something for that scene. Um, and. There was no world that it was going to be upbeat and happy. There was just not even a world that it was going to happen. I, I, the, that didn't need, that. there wasn't, they had that. That was already there. I'm not, that's, that's also not what I do, y'all. <laughs> not what I do. So, uh, yeah, it was obvious what we were going to make, I think. Yeah. But you say that, that you, she wanted the heart song, and I heard Mark Ronson say this on another panel, which was that when they heard this song, they basically, if you go back and watch the movie and pay attention, they they string what was I made for, the melody of it, throughout, and you'll see it starts popping up when Barbie starts having complicated feelings, and it's sort of like, it is her heart song sort of pulling her towards where she was going, and they weave their song back into the whole movie. I'm now Mark Ronson. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Let's talk, America, about the speech that you give that is the heart of the movie and that um, is now going to basically make you the uh, symbol of feminism for the next 40 years. So yes. hope you're comfortable with that. Um, so let's just back it up a little bit. What did you think when you read it and how did you prepare to completely naturally, as if off the top of your head, kind of come out with this, I'll call it a cri de coeur, like a cry of the heart of like what it's like to be a woman today that's connected with everybody. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's so amazing. I love hearing musicians talk about their process because it's it just feels like such an alien thing. But hearing you talk about it, it's it is so much a similar thing of you get a story and a character that you get to step into and you get to see it through their very specifically written journey. But really, you know, what it is is it's like different portals into like your own journey, your own feelings, your own, you know, my version of that. Like I never played with Barbies growing up ever. They, um, we couldn't afford them. I didn't really feel like seen. There was nothing accessible to me about the Barbie world and Barbie land. Um, and so it just like was never really that part of my life. But, but for me, what Barbie in this movie stands for, and, and this is what I think the true genius of Greta and Noah writing the script, is that they didn't just make something up and make you care about it. They took something that everybody has already has a feeling about, whether you love it or hate it or have written it off or you think it has nothing to do with you. They pulled off this magician's trick of taking something that you think you knew how you felt about and then taking you on a journey where it's like, it's not even about Barbie, this is about us, mm. right? And, and, and so not having feelings about Barbie, my feeling of what was representative of Barbie is what is that thing as a child that made you feel like anything was possible? That's what Barbie is to Gloria. Gloria's very specific experience with Barbie is when I played with Barbies, everything and anything was possible. And now I'm a grown adult woman in the world and she lied to me because everything is not possible and I'm frustrated and I'm hitting dead ends and my daughter who I poured everything into me is pulling away and my husband is my husband and all <laughs> things and, um, and, and so for her, it was how do I get back to the feeling of anything is possible, which is also at the core of your song, right? It's, it's how do we get back to that thing of like, oh yeah, life and it's good and it's fun and it's passionate and maybe everything's not possible, but we can try, you know? And for me as a child, that was, that was performance. Like that's where I was allowed to be everything. You know, my feelings weren't too big for anyone. I could be all the things and and so I did think that the for me it was trying to find reconcile like who is this woman who is both very real and flawed and frustrated and stuck in her life but somehow has the child has held on to has maintained the childlike wonder of I can summon Barbie into the real world with my imagination you know and and that was such a joy and it's, I think it says something that it felt weird to me to begin with, because I think in real life, I am that woman. I'm silly and fun and have an imagination and full of wonder, and I'm a serious businesswoman who a lot of people are afraid of. Um, and like, and like, yeah, and we can be all of those things, but kind of the way we're used to seeing ourselves projected back to ourselves is not someone who gets to be all those things. You're in that box or you're in this box or you're the dorky best friend or you're the girl next door or you're the hot chick or you're the one the guy wants or the one the guy doesn't want, right? Like we're used to just seeing ourselves in boxes and not as the whole human beings that we are. And so for me, um, I get Gloria and Greta's names mixed up all the time. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, Gloria's journey in this is like finding her way back for herself and for all of Barbie land, <clears throat> finding her way back to a place where she gets to be all the things she is. And not surprisingly, like, I feel like that's been my personal journey too. And, and, the, and the journey of making the Barbie movie in a deeply personal way has been a, a journey of, of getting to that place for myself too. And where it's like, oh, I'm telling Gloria's story, but then somehow you're like, oh, it wasn't just Gloria's story, it was my story too. Um, so yeah, I still, I don't remember your question, but that's <laughs> <laughs> I talked in paragraphs. I do I do Sorry, not sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, what, I, what I was asking when, let's see. <laughs> I still want to know what it felt like to deliver the speech. Yeah. And of course, it's clear when you read this, I'm sure when you read the script or you see the movie, that is what the movie is there for, is to get to that moment and express that point of view. Was it, um, did you have to do a lot of takes? Did you, ha did you have to say it in front of the mirror a bunch? Like, how did you prepare? Because it has to come off feeling like 
right straight from your heart, like from your gut, actually. Yeah, we shot that scene for two days. Mm -hmm. So wow. I probably ended up saying that monologue top to bottom, like, I want to say around 50 times. Oh, wow. Like, Sasha, who plays, Ariana, who plays Sasha, my daughter, she had memorized it at the end, and she, like, said it back to me. <laughs> and I sobbed, and she was really great in it. And, um, we, yeah, I, we shot it for two days. But we had, Greta and I had talked about it for months, like, we talked about every time there was something in the culture, like this article, or that story, or this episode of TV, or this op-ed, everything that had to do with the monologue, we would just share and relate to what's happening in the culture, but also to what we've experienced as individual women. And, and, and also, you know, I had 40 years experience of being a woman, so that helped. And then, <laughs> you know, I think by the time we got to, to doing it, I had, I had had all these months to deeply weave each of those lines so personally with my own experiences and and you know which helps because then you don't have to act or overact you get to just say the words and let the words kind of pull whatever thread it pulls and because we did it for so long Greg, that, that that it was such a gift to have time with the words and to have time with um, letting each take take me wherever it was going to. There were takes that ended in hysterical laughter, takes that ended in rage. I think there was literally a take where I turned into a dragon and I just screamed. <laughs> and I'm glad I've never had to watch that take. And you know, it, it, it was just doing it and letting, and, and it was different and unique from every other day on set where Greta was very specific with what she wanted. She had a very, um, like she, she's a dancer and I think she's musical by nature and like the way she heard the dialogue was so specific in her head in a lot of ways very musical and, and Ryan always says that she was like always tuning us and that's right, she would close her eyes and have us run the lines and then she, she'd tune us, she'd make us go faster or slower or slow it down or where the, so it was always very specific and then when we got to this monologue, the day of I was like, oh, how did you hear this? And it was the only time on set that she said, I don't know. I want you to find it. I wow. want you to play and to find it. And that was scary, but also felt like so much faith that she had in me and I had so much faith in her. And then we just laughed and cried for two days and did the monologue. Mm. And I was very tired um, at the end, but also it felt personally cathartic and maybe this is too much information, but I feel like in my own personal life, like I had to live that monologue through my body. And so there are times where I'll go to like look at the mirror and be like, I haven't worked out in two days. And then I'll just hear Gloria be like, we already said the monologue. We don't get to go back and do that. And it's like, she still lives in my head and is saying monologue all the time. So in a way it felt personally transformative. I never asked. I think that it's, I don't know. You'll have to ask Greta. How deep into the shoot was it? It was at the end. That was the other thing is like I'd been holding all this anticipation for months and months and I was just ready to go. I'm like, please let me just get this out. So it was like a relief when it was done. Yeah. Did, while you were discussing it, did the monologue like shift, evolve, change or like it did, yeah. yeah. We added some stuff. We we made things simplified, like like the always be grateful line, but never forget that the system is rigged. So find a way to acknowledge that, but also always be grateful. That was something that that came out of our conversations. The um, you know, it's like a catechism you now. You can be, just kind of I kind of can. Yeah. Okay. The you have to you know love being a mom, but also don't talk about your kids all the damn time. Like that came <laughs> out of a lot of our. Like there were, yeah, we, we tweaked and played with it and personalized it and made it feel, yeah, it just kind of felt, um, by the time the words came out, it was just so deeply, I think, um, threaded throughout my personal experience. I would take a couple questions if you guys are okay with that. Yeah? I didn't, I didn't say I was going to do that, but yes, sir, go ahead, stand up and speak, speak 
Hello. Well, first of all, thank you all for being here and for your beautiful contributions, not only to this film, but to feminism in general. We love it. <laughs> so, the first thing, uh, Billy, my 65-year-old mother, has asked to please tell you that you are her number one artist on Spotify. So, <laughs> uh, so I'd like to touch upon something, Phineas, that you mentioned that uh, America also ties into your monologue. I'm curious if, as creatives or as people, Phineas, you mentioned still feeling like a fan who snuck in in the back, for example. Yeah. Do you ever still feel imposter syndrome at times, and how do you work through that? Did you memorize that? <laughs> that was like pretty oh, clear. That was like a whole, like, whole thing. Um, yeah. I wish I was as eloquent as you. It's just amazing. Yeah, I got right to it. Um, thank you for that question, and thank you to your, your mother, your grandma? My mom. Your mom, cute. Um, that's very sweet. I don't ha I don't have grandparents, so I always hope that people, whatever. Um, <laughs> yikes. Okay. Um, you asked, do I feel imposter syndrome? Lol. Yeah. Um, most of my life is spent feeling that way. Um, it's very weird in my life. It's very strange. I even think, you know, our involvement in this movie, like, again, we just feel like such fans and we've now gotten to go to these amazing things like the Globes and the Critics' Choice and, like, you know, Barbie or America or anyone will, will win or be nominated. And, like, it's like, uh, it, I've described it as, like, not dissimilar to being a fan of, like, a sports team where you're like, we, we won. <laughs> like, I did not kick the ball into the end zone. Um, so... Again, it's like, but I, but my hope is that everybody that loves Barbie feels that way. My hope is that everybody that loves anything feels like it's it's a we. Um, but we do feel like we've gotten to join the, we're like honorary members of the Barbie entourage. Yeah, it's funny, cool. like being at the tables at like award shows and, you know, we're sitting with like America, Margot, <coughs> Greta, Greta Mark, Ryan, yeah. Mark. It's crazy. I mean, it feels very surreal and very um, silly. <laughs> I'm like... Who let me in here? I don't know. It's just like it, life is so insane, and, and I think that being being asked at all to be a part of this movie was so crazy, and yeah. being a part of it is amazing, and, and the cultural impact that this movie had on us all is is something that will will truly go down in like the history books, and I'm I'm so honored and lucky to be a part of that. I feel I feel so so grateful, and you know when the song when the movie came out, and every video I saw online was like somebody's story of being a woman and being a person in the world and it was to my song I felt so I felt like one with the girls and I felt like one with the people and it felt really special and I I um, I don't know I held that I hold that really close to my heart because it, it really meant a lot to me and I feel endlessly grateful for that what about you do you feel imposter syndrome well, I want to break this question down. <laughs> because they thought about it. Because we're talking about two different things. I think what you guys are talking about, I think everybody on this movie felt, which was, I feel so lucky to be here. Like, I think I'm constantly like, I can't believe I'm sitting next to Billy. Hey! Oh, my God. And I think that, that, that excitement and that wonder and that joy of like, wow, I get to be here and watch Rodrigo Prieto work. Like, I get to, I get to watch Margo and Ryan and, and all of these incredible, and Greta, like, I think that that's, I don't think we should ever lose that. I think, like you said, I think feeling, you know, that's the joy of, like, I got invited to the party and it's fun. And, and that's also what helps you, you know, kind of, up your game and then play your best because they're playing their best. And so I think that's one thing and I think it's great and it's positive. I think I've started thinking of this thing that, that what, what, what do we really mean when we say imposter syndrome? And I would say my, the, the quick, I don't give quick answers, the quick answer <laughs> to do I ever feel imposter syndrome is yes. But I've come to think of it very differently because what imposter syndrome says to us is that you know, you walk into a space and you and what you feel is, I don't belong here. Everybody else belongs here and I don't belong here. And I've come to think of the titling of it as imposter syndrome, as like victim shaming, where I'm like, and now I'm giving myself like a disease that I have because, you know, not only do I not belong here, but like, I don't even 
I'm not, I don't even feel like I belong here, so I'm doing this the wrong way. And you just shrink yourself. You get smaller and smaller and smaller. And what I, and I don't really have the replacement, so maybe one of you can think of what the replacement word is for imposter syndrome. But I think that the difference of the way I look at it is like, oh, it's not my fault that I feel like I don't belong in this space. Everything for my whole life has told me I don't belong wow. in this space. So it's not really imposter syndrome, it's appropriate reaction to what I've been told my whole life. <laughs> and whatever yeah. syndrome, whatever yeah. that is, you know? And because one makes me feel more shameful. Mm. One makes me feel like, shit, I don't know what I'm doing, and I feel really small around these geniuses, mm -hmm. and no one knows it, and they're gonna find out, and they're gonna kick me out. <laughs> Instead of all these smart people think I belong here, and I've worked really hard, and I am here, and I've done the work. Why do I still feel like I don't belong here? Because I believe what I've been told and taught my whole life, that I don't belong here. So I just think we have to, like, for our own selves, start thinking about it differently. Of, like, I feel strange in this space because I am a stranger in this space. Because a lot of us are the first people like us to be in these spaces. And so, in a way, it's the most appropriate response you can have. We're just calling it the wrong thing. No pressure, but we would like it to be a good question. <laughs> um, I'm going to, that person, uh, right there, sir. Yes, go ahead. Although we probably should hear from a question from a woman. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, um, <laughs> we're going to double, 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 that means we'll take two more, because I don't want to pick someone. Okay, yes, we'll go with you, ma'am. Just hold on one second. Yeah, yeah, we'll come to you. Okay, sir, let's make it quick, though, because I guess they're busy. No, I, Hi, oh, you are a woman. Oh, amazing. Hi. I couldn't, I, that's not that I couldn't see. I couldn't, it's really dark. Sorry. Please. Hi, uh, my name is Eileen Fuentes, and I never get up and talk. Well, I have been a woman here for a long, long time, and I'm fifth generation Mekan. And uh, my father used to say something uh, when he thought he saw a, me a Mexican. He said, I'm mi gente, mi gente. And it turned out it was a cow. He thought he saw migrant workers. And we got close and said, Daddy, it's a cow, it's not a mi, mi gente. Mm -hmm. So we would always joke about that. But I've been waiting, I've been in this business for 40 years. And I've been waiting to see America. Mm -hmm. I've been waiting. <laughs> I've been proud to see her. And wonderful to see that face looking back at me, but she took me into her, a person, smart, beautiful, intuitive, introspective. That's who I stopped seeing her face. Mm -hmm. I just saw her, and that's why I'm very proud. Thank you for that. Thank you, Greta. <laughs> Okay, one more, if it's a question. That was beautiful, thank you for sharing that. That was beautiful. Um, and thank you for what you said, America. I'm from Honduras, and you're the only, oh shit, you're the only person that I've looked up to that has to open the doors because I'm like from that country that there's nothing, so thank you. Um, my question, I'm a director, so my question goes to you about working with directors, and now that you're gonna direct your first project, your first like feature, feature. Um, what is, like, what are some qualities or um, questions or ways that you've worked with directors that it, you will take into your projects? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a great question. I think we could all answer that, because you all have also worked with directors. Um, I would say, and I, you know, I'll keep it about Greta because why not? Um, the most beautiful thing, uh, so many things are so beautiful about Greta. She's so smart. She's so uh, prepared. She works so hard. But the thing that she leads with is just her utter joy. You know, which is not the case for every director. All directors don't 
you know, lead with joy when they're doing the thing that apparently they want to do more than anything else. Um, yeah. Uh, she leads with her heart. And I think the thing she understands about directing is that it's a team sport. Like, you're, why bring Billy and Phineas into the room if you're not going to get Billy and Phineas, if you just are like, I just want you to draw a circle, so can you just draw the circle? It's like, no, I want Billy and Phineas' a circle. So like, draw the circle, but you, like make it you. And that's what Greta did with everyone, from everyone, musicians, prop makers, like the point of making movies, it is a collaborative team sport. And the director is the, is, is uh, I guess, I don't know, sports coach <laughs> sports better um, uh, it's like you're the coach like you have a vision for where we're going and I can give you my opinion about how we get there but you're gonna make it better at the end of the day you got to make the prop you got to make the set you got to throw the ball and make it to third base hey and now <laughs> yeah. um, like and, and watching Greta, and, and I see this too in every director that I've had an amazing experience with, and, and, and they get great work from people, is that you know it's not on you to come in and know everything. It's not on you to come in and have all the answers. The beauty of making work and being creative with other people who know the most about their field, more than you're ever gonna know as a director, is, is the getting to have ideas together and everyone to bring something and what I experienced as an actress with Greta is how sacred that was to her how that process of bringing something unique and new and true in the moment requires such protection and requires so much I think respect for what it is you're asking people to bring through you're not asking people to say lines you're not asking people to hit a mark you're asking people to bring through a part of their soul and so you don't just say action and cut, you're creating a space and you're protecting a sacred space where something new and true and soulful can happen. And, and I, I, I learned that through, lot, through my 22 year career, but I saw it embodied in watching how Greta works. And I think that is what you're feeling when you watch this movie, you're feeling something that was made from soul and made because she took something as um, fake and plastic as a Barbie doll and she brought soul through it. And that is like, I mean, that's, that's, I don't know what else is inspiration if not that, right? Do you guys want to answer that? Sorry, I talk so much. I think that's a great note to wrap it up on. Thank you so much, America. Yeah. 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 Yeah.